DMT, which is a near relative of psilocybin, psilocybin I mentioned, 4-phosphoroxy-NN-DMT. Now I want to talk about NN-DMT. This is a compound, the commonest hallucinogen in nature. Note that, because if an alien were spreading hallucinogens around, this would be the one to look at. It's the commonest one. You smoke it. It only lasts three to seven minutes. Not long, folks. Anybody can invest three to seven minutes, I would think, in an experiment which might alter your complete ontology. What happens when you smoke DMT? Well, here's what happens to me. And this place has its low. It's no higher than this ceiling. And it's actually about the size of this room, but rounded, softeted lighting, indirect lighting. Uh, But the main action is you are instantly plunged into an environment of elf intelligence, self-transforming machine elves, I call these things, or types, just for want of a better name. They are not cheerfully portrayed and suitable material for t-shirts and coffee mugs. They are self-transforming, jeweled, basketball-like things. It's not clear they are made of matter. They are made of light. Their status on the phylogeny of biology is extraordinarily murky. Uh, And they come pounding forward like badly trained dogs, cheering. They say, here you are. You may all recall, some of you may recall that old Pink Floyd song, the gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. So there you are. Now, 20 seconds before, you were in an apartment somewhere with your scuzzy friends doing drugs. (laughs) Now that's gone. And you are in this place being confronted by these entities. And one of the things they do that's quite disconcerting is they come jumping up or dribbling up to you, and then they will sort of vibrate in place. Then they jump into your chest. Then they jump back out. But the main thing is they are doing something very, very interesting. What they're doing is they, I call, the reason I call them language elves is because they possess an ontos of language that is completely alien to us. They use a language which you can see. They can condense meaning before your very eyes. For them, syntax is not acoustical rules. It's pictorial rules. And they are doing this. They will scramble forward, elbowing each other, jumping up and down, very excited. And they say, look at this. Look at this. And they pull objects, sing objects into existence and show them to you. And as your attention goes into these things, you, you are, it's, the emotion is indescribable. These objects are made of gold, ivory, smaragdine, chalcedony, beryllium, ytterbium, flesh, gold, blood, heat, tears. And it's all changing, morphing as you look at it. And as you look at this, you have without an iota of doubt the conviction, if I could bring this thing across, it would end human history. Argument would cease. You would just say, look, look at this. And they're pushing each other away, showing you, look at this one, look at this one. These objects themselves emit sound and make other objects. The whole thing is going on in an atmosphere of incredible hilarity and confusion. It's now one minute since you left your scuzzy (laughs) friends in that badly furnished apartment. (laughs) Naturally, the the fact that you're having this experience raises certain fundamental questions, such as, am I dead now? Is that what's happened? And the entities say, they say, 
don't give way to amazement. Don't flip out about how you can't believe it and it's impossible and so forth and so on. Don't do that. Just pay attention. Pay attention to what we are doing and what we are showing you. And what they preach is a new dispensation of language, a language that can be beheld. And as you sit there, you feel like a bubble form in your stomach and begin to make its way to your mouth. And when it comes out as a kind of a glossolalia, you discover that in that space, you too can make jeweled objects with spinning interiors and reflexively rotating sub-themes and so forth and so on, all driven by a kind of spontaneous glossolalia-like verbal uh, activity that is very spontaneous and undescribable but fortunately doable. It sounds like this. This is a pictorial activity. Now, when I went to the Amazon, I discovered, I didn't discover, I went to, they've been known for years, tribes of people using a hallucinogen called ayahuasca. And when you take ayahuasca with these people, they sing. And then they have like little intermissions. And I would be in my horrible Spanish ear listening to these people. And the guy next to me is saying to the guy next to him about the song, he says, I love the olive drab part. But when he got into that thing with the silver on magenta, I just thought it was tacky. And I'm, what? Say what? You realize these people, for them, sound is being transduced in the visual cortex. The ordinary processing of acoustical input is being shunted to the visual cortex. This is the same thing the DMT types are talking about. And these are the very jungle tribes that it's always been charged had group mind, telepathy, ways of creating a social cohesion that was contravened reason. This is what's going on, I think. Now, uh, I then studied this phenomenon of language very carefully. I mean, it never even occurred to me of visual language. I discovered, however, that nature has anticipated this phenomenon in the organisms that are known to us as octopi and cephalopods. As you all know, as you're probably graduates of those horrible nature specials on TV, octopi can change color. Most people think this is camouflage. It isn't camouflage. It is language. Octopi control an enormous repertoire of what are called traveling dots, blushes, shadings, striping, wavy lines, and a huge color palette. These uh, exterior changes on the surface of the octopus are a direct readout of its state of mind. It wears its mind on its surface. And you may not know, but at the third gastrulation of the blastopore in the human fetus, the, it becomes the surface of the body. The surface of the body is brain tissue, essentially, a very thin sheet of brain tissue all over the outside of the body. That's why there are so many nerves in the skin means it's the visual acquisition of meaning rather than the audio acquisition of meaning because there is no ambiguity you see we use local languages if your dictionary matches my dictionary you can understand me and that's fine if we're saying you know could you close the door or get me a grant? But if what we're saying, if we're talking about the ontology of language, 
or the political obligations to the community in the light of the inevitability of mortality or something like that, then acoustically transduced sound and common dictionaries don't cut the mustard. One of the most uncool things you can say in any situation is, would you please explain to me what I just said? Because that rends the fabric and we're then faced in the mud of the fact that nobody understands or even bothers to listen to anybody else. And if they do, they don't get it anyway. Well, I, I think that uh, we are on the collision course with a planet transforming event and that we have been for a very, very long time. I also believe that it lies below the horizon of rational apprehension at this point in time. It's, it's, if you're in this game for fun, there's lots of fun to be had. If you're in this game for final answers, I suggest you take up geometry. Uh, it will be much more satisfying. There isn't going to be closure. I mean, because after all, don't lose sight of the fact that we're advanced monkeys of some sort. The idea that advanced monkeys could in fact unearth and then cognize the secret of the universe is like expecting the same thing from termites or, or you know, mussels. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. I mean, we are embedded in mystery. Our brains were evolved to keep us from being eaten by nearby hungry competitors. It is not a tool for philosophy. Uh, philosophy comes later. And uh, I, I think that what the UFO community and what the psychedelic community share is a tremendous impatience with uh, scien scientism and the fascism of scientism. And the way to overcome these things is to simply opt out of the historical game and avail yourselves of the shamanic tools which have always been there. The uh, whisperings from the other dimension are probably a thousand millennia old. That's a million years. That's the time that we have been sitting around campfires, spinning yarns for each other, and looking up at the night sky. We are not alone on this planet, but it may be that we are the late evolving intelligence. Uh, the mushroom said to me once, uh, it said, I said, what are you doing here? It said, you're a mushroom, you live cheap. I said, but it, it, it said it, it was not such a bad neighborhood till the monkeys went berserk. And that was only yesterday. So you see, it isn't that they're coming to us from the stars. It's that we are finally having the scales fall, fall from our eyes to realize what it means to be on a water-heavy, oxygen-rich planet with over two and a half billion years of biological history already neatly tucked under the belt. I mean, the, the, the uh, peculiarities and singularities that have been built into our circumstance, I believe, would literally stand our hair on end. And the only way the only way to make your way through this morass of claim and counterclaim is do not move your faith an iota beyond your own direct experience. If you haven't seen a UFO, believe no one. No photograph, no testimony, no nothing. Because it's all, everything is contaminated. Forget UFOs. Take Mount Everest. Have you seen it? Then for you, it doesn't exist. I saw it. It couldn't possibly be the world's largest mountain. I could hold it between this finger and this finger. <laughs> so, then if you limit yourself to direct experience, 
Does that mean that you're shit out of luck? No. It means that you have arrived at the beginning of the real path toward the saucer. Because you don't want to hear that Whitley Strieber or Bud Hopkins walked in through the purple doorway and was never seen again. You want to be the person to walk through the purple doorway and never be seen again. Well, I guarantee you it's uh, more easily done than you might wish to suppose, uh, but you're going to have to um, avail yourself of the shamanic technology, which is a super technology, uh, of the shamanic technology that we inherit from the archaic civilizations. Not everybody fell into physics, worship, and materialism. The rainforest cultures, the aboriginal cultures, have kept the channel open while we dithered and mucked about in the historical process, materialism, scientism, positivism, you name it. But the doorway lies open. The problem is it requires an act of courage, real courage, because it's real. It's absolutely real. But the sine qua non is the psychedelic molecule. It was designed this way. It isn't that it's impossible to encounter these things in any other fashion, but it's impossible to coherently encounter them in any other fashion uh, because that's the part that is obtruding into the social sphere and that's the area where contention, control, informational viruses, disinformation, false testimony, uh, hidden agendas are totally corrupting of the phenomenon. But you can get it down to you and it if you will simply avail yourself of the psychedelic tools that nature created and that shamanism places at our disposal. That's where the frontier of this hyper-technical fantasy is headed toward a revivification of knowledge systems that were ancient when the pyramids were not yet even a gleam in the eye. Question. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's lots of fun. You have no idea how much fun this is. Yeah. I have a few questions. Uh, one, are you aware of any psychedelics being used in ancient Greece around the time of Plato or Aristotle? Sure. Um, you should read The Road to Eleusis by Wasson and Hoffman that argues very persuasively that an LSD-like alkaloid lay behind the Eleusinian mysteries. That was, that was the great mystery religion uh, that inspired all of the movers and shakers of, of the Hellenistic world. And your second question? Good question. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that occurs in almost all life. It occurs from flatworms to human beings. And interestingly, as you ascend the phylogeny, there is more and more serotonin. More in mammals than in any other major order of animals. More in uh, primates than in any other kind of mammal. And more in man than in any other primate. Serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine. DMT, I'm sorry, psilocybin, 4-phosphoryloxy, and then DMT. Although it must be said that the phosphorus group is clipped off almost immediately and it becomes psilocin. Uh, for hydroxy and then dimethyltryptamine. Uh, I believe that on one level what's happening is that there is a kind of evolutionary competition going on. Obviously some neurotransmitters are more efficient than others and it may be that we are only a one or two gene mutation away from a swapping out of serotonin 
for some more efficient, whatever that might mean, neurotransmitter. Now, romantically, wouldn't it be nice if psilocybin were it? I suspect it isn't because psilocybin is not known to be elaborated in the tissue of any higher animal. But what's a good candidate is uh, there is an enzyme in the pineal gland called adenoroglomerotropine that chemically analyzed turns out to be harmaline. It's a beta carboline. It's, it's uh, 4-hydroxy tetrahydroharmalan. These harmine molecules are part of the mystery. Incredibly bioelectronically active with a structure that assimilates to the Anjana chakra. And they are the uh, molecules which are a part of the ayahuasca brew. I think we're on the brink of a tremendous evolutionary adventure and that it will involve physically redesigning ourselves Look at the mushroom. I'm mean, just to go off on a wild tear here. Mushrooms are what are called primary decomposers, fungi, right? It means they only live off dead matter. Now, vegetarianism is held up as a spiritual ideal, but compared to the strategy of mushrooms, vegetarianism is an orgy of mass death on an appalling scale. Uh, so if perhaps the mushroom is essentially Buddhist in its approach, notice how, how non-invasive of the world of matter the mushroom is. It forms a diaphanous network through the soil as tenuous as cobwebs and yet filled with neurotransmitters. And you may remember from last year, it was discovered that the largest organisms on this planet are mushroom mycelial mats. They're, they cover acres. They weigh more than blue whales. And they're so old, it's better not even to speak of it. Uh, this looks to me like this is what intelligence, driven by ethical concern for life, would design itself into. Say, no harm. We want to be primary decomposers. We want to be as diaphanous as cobwebs. We want to be a spore-bearing life form that can percolate through the universe. And we want to have instantaneous access time to the galactic databases. This is what the mushroom looks like. And, you know, if you think this is malarkey, please do not intellectually evade the challenge that it poses you. Because if you think this is malarkey, then take mushrooms and tell me I'm full of shit. That's all. That's all you have to do, you know? It's easy. It, you don't have to camp out on some mesa in New Mexico for three weeks. Uh, yeah. Normally, I think it was psilocybin or the, or the tryptamine had a higher dose. Yeah. And the only four phosphoryl endos, and that makes it... Uh, Especially uh, understandable, something an alien would present. Is that essentially correct? Because it's so unique. Yes, because it's unique. In other words, I can imagine a scenario like this: uh, a spore-bearing life form somewhere in the universe. It does everything with the technology of DNA. And it, you see these spores actually can survive in the environment of outer space. I mean, that's what they love. If you store spores, you store them at 220 degrees below zero in liquid nitrogen. You store them in an outer space-like environment. Well, you can imagine a spore drifting in here, inculcating itself into the environment and then play, uh, carrying out a complete survey. And then isn't it strange that these mushrooms were right in our paths as we left the trees and descended onto the African grassland? My book, Food of the Gods, I argued uh, that... Uh, uh, I thought of a joke about food of the gods, but I won't belabor it with you. <clears throat> no, no, it was something about smorgasbord of the gods. But I argued that psilocybin is what propelled us into humanness. But I didn't discuss the potential alien origin of the mushroom itself. 
I just said there is an X factor in human history. Something caused the human brain size to double in about a million years. No straight anthropologist or evolutionary primatologist has a clue as to what it was. And I think that psilocybin is like an enzyme for cognitive activity and that it coaxed out of us language, theater, art, religion, poetry, all of these things, and it created a kind of partnership paradise, a, a role-appropriate, ba sexually balanced, gender-honoring, child-sensitive, nature-sensitive civilization. And that all fell to pieces about 15,000 years ago and we have been on, you know, a, a death march into hell ever since. As soon as you get agriculture, you get surplus. That gives you haves and have-nots and the need to beat out the brains of people who are not in your social group because they're trying to get at your grain storage. Agriculture means the end of nomadism. It means sedentary populations. It means cities. It means standing armies, male kingship, hierarchical structures, uh, law, all of the stuff that is so odious and horrible and that has led us so wrong. I mean, it may have seemed like a good idea at Ur, but we're the unhappy inheritors of the consequence of 6,000 years of unopposed dominator culture. And what have we got? A shattered atmosphere, toxified oceans, schizophrenic populations, and mendacious politicians. This is not what our parents raised us for, folks. A woman. Yeah. Genetic chance. The end all gets created, people respond to it and then are drawn to it and they keep on co evolving together. As people evolve, they find more and more substances that they can then go further with. Does it have to be a teacher from outside introducing these things to simple animals? No, it doesn't. You're quite right. I mean, I'm not at all clear on the location of these things. Uh, the people who just assume that these are that metal ships from other star systems arrive here have a lot of explaining to do. I mean, I, I was fascinated by the last speaker with the you don't go there, you grab the space and move it to you. Well, then obviously the question is, well, how do you grab it? You know, something crosses that stellar distance instantly, and I don't think you can fake your way around it. It's a tough nut to crack. Now, there may be, uh, I think it's, uh, there's an image, and I'll, we're getting close to the end, so I'll leave you with it because it amuses me so much. As you know, the world's largest radio telescope is at Arecibo, Puerto Rico. And as you probably know, a multi-million channel analyzer has been attached to that thing, and there's been funding for another deep space search. And so there they are at Arecibo with the world's largest radio telescope reaching out, you know, mega maruby sticks into the universe. <laughs> when you actually go there, the telescope was built into a natural bowl which they made further, they rounded out, and then they planted grass in this bowl to halt erosion. Well, then to keep the grass from getting out of hand, they brought in white cows to crop the grass. So they're in the grass beneath the world's largest radio telescope engaged in searching for extraterrestrial life is the mushroom in great profusion. If you wanted it, that's where you'd go and get it. And that is the perfect symbol for how we search for extraterrestrial life. Uh, it's at your feet, my friends. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>